It is so wonderful to see everybody this morning. Uh, we have a lot of children who are here today, and um, I, w I want to uh, I want to do something before we begin our sermon time, and I want to ask all of our children to stand up. Just stand up where you are, and if you're holding a child, would you stand up too? I want I want you to stand. Everybody stand. All the children stand up, and. Um, I know that you have a, perhaps a lot of questions going through your mind. You don't know what's going on a lot of time. But there's something I want you to remember. I want you to remember when you came to church on Sunday and you left, that you remember that Jesus loves you. I want you to know how much Jesus loves you and that he's going to take care of you and that he's going to be with you whatever happens. So for our children while they're standing, I want you to sing with me, Jesus Loves Me. Now, as you know, I'm not a song leader, so I'm going to start this song, and then I'm going to turn my mic off. <laughs> and I'm going to count on you. So let's sing together. Jesus Loves Me. don't sit down yet okay I want you to know that Jesus loves you he loves you more than anything he loves you and I want you to know back there that Jesus loves you and I want the children the babies to know that Jesus loves you and I don't care who else does it you need to know I want all of these children to know that Jesus loves you and if you forget everything that you learn in church if you forget everything that the preacher says, because sometimes he's not very bright and he says things that kind of, you know, go over my head a little bit and, and sometimes he even says stuff that he might not should say. He's gotten in trouble with parents before for that, actually. Um, but here's what I want you to never forget. Never forget that Jesus loves you. Now you can be seated. They had to be afraid. They had to be afraid because they had been with Jesus. They had spent time with him every single day. Everywhere Jesus went and talked, they followed him. Everywhere Jesus spent time, they were with him. They were called disciples. That means learner, follower. He was called by many rabbi. That means teacher. They took in everything that he said. And he had told them that he was going to have to go away. And even there in John 14, when Jesus told them he was going to go away, he said, but I don't want you to be afraid. You remember the verse. You can quote John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. And then Jesus said, I'm going to go away, but you don't have to be afraid because I'm going to send to you a comforter. Did you hear that, church? You don't have to be afraid because you have, if you are in Christ, you have in your life a comforter who will care for you and who will be there for you and who the Bible teaches us will intercede for you. But they were, oh, they're, they're so much like we are. I mean, let's be honest. There are times that, that we don't know what's going to happen. We, we don't know the future. We're concerned about people that we love and that we care about. And we're, we're afraid. They might have been afraid because they felt alone. I mean, the one who had taught them, who had prayed with them, who had showed them the way, all of a sudden he's not there anymore. They had to feel alone. They, they were uncertain about the future. Anybody relate to that right now? 
They're uncertain about the future. If they would have had them, they would have cleaned the stores out. They were uncertain about the future. And are you ready for this? They were quarantined. They were. They were. The Bible tells us that. They were quarantined. Jesus quarantined them. Listen to these words. Luke chapter 24. Jesus had risen from the grave. Some of them had seen him. They didn't. Some didn't believe. Some of the disciples that we're going to read about over in Acts 1 probably had heard that Jesus was raised. They hadn't seen him. They didn't know for certain. John chapter 21 tells us that when, when the disciples were out in a boat, and remember what it says that Jesus came to Tiberias, the sea of, where the Sea of Galilee was, where some of us were recently and we kept praying that we'd get out of there. They, they were there and Jesus came. And you know what the Bible says? That they didn't know it was him. They didn't know it was him. But now Jesus is with them. Dr. Luke says this, that he ate a meal with them. We can assume that's somewhere around the Sea of Galilee, just like, just like John 21 tells us. And Jesus said to them, verse 44, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. They hadn't previously understood this. And he said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgive, forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Now look at this next verse 49. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. Remember he had told them back in John 14, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send a comforter who will be there with you. Jesus says, remember I told you this previously, but I'm telling you now I'm going to send forth the promise of my Father upon you. Now look at verse 49. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. Jesus quarantined them. Don't leave the city. You go there and you wait. The promise that I had given you previously, the promise of the Father, he's going to come. And verse 50 says, he led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. And so they had joy in their hearts. But if you turn over to Acts chapter 1, if you will now, Acts 1 kind of, uh, it, it kind of uh, uh, goes along with what we've just read there in, in the, at the end of Luke. And it kind of uh, intersects. Look at verse 4 beginning. Well, go back to verse 3. To those he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And so now... Uh, there's this time period. Jesus had told them to go to Jerusalem and wait there. He quarantined them in Jerusalem to these, uh, now look at verse 4, gathering them together. He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. There's that idea of that promise again. The same thing he had said back in Luke chapter 24. The same thing he had said in John chapter 14. I want you to stay in Jerusalem. Wait here. Don't go anywhere else. Don't do anything else. You stay right here. He quarantined them in Jerusalem. Now back then, Jerusalem wasn't like it is today. Today, Jerusalem is an is a active, bustling city with more than a million people who live there and more than a million others who come and visit every year. It's, it's a busy place. But back then it was small and, and everything was close together in proximity and, and, and everybody probably knew each other. It's kind of like your old hometown. And Jesus says to them, I want you to go and I want you to wait in Jerusalem. And everybody knew, everybody who knew these followers of Jesus, 
They knew that Christ had been crucified. Not everybody in Jerusalem probably believed that he would, had been raised and they're probably wondering what in the world are these guys doing now? Jesus says you go and wait for the promise, the promise. John 14, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I'm going to send the comforter to you. That's the promise. He had reiterated it in Luke chapter 24 and now he tells them again. Look at verse 12 of Acts chapter, well, go to Acts chapter 1 verse 9. After he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and the cloud received them out of the sight, probably standing on, on um, the Mount of Olives there that overlooks the, the, the old city of Jerusalem. You can picture it in your mind if you've been there and you can see as you're standing on the Mount of Olives, the, the gate to the old city and, and the, what's called the Eastern Gate. The Eastern Gate has been closed down. And between, I wish I had my picture up here. Uh, to, to show you, but you could see how the eastern gate has been sealed off. And between the Mount of Olives and the eastern gate, there's a valley. It's called the Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley, by the way, is where Jesus had to walk through the Kidron Valley to get to Gethsemane. And when Jesus walked through, when he walked from the house of Caiaphas where he, he had been on trial and he's coming from Jerusalem, he walks through the Kidron Valley. He crosses the street there which is, probably wasn't a street there then, but he walks through and he walks in the garden. And there was what is called that flowed through the Kidron Valley, the Brook Kidron. And possibly, during that time of the Passover, two million lambs were killed. Two million in a week. You ever thought about that? Ever wondered, what about the blood? Where, where did the blood go? Well, the blood, some, some suggest that they had built a special trough where the blood would run out the back of the temple. And you know where it went? It went, it flowed through. And if it didn't come out, if it didn't flow out, then they poured it out there and they poured it into the brook Kidron. And I want you to think about this. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world is walking through that valley and in all probability we, we can almost be certain that when he looked down and saw the brook Kidron, he saw red. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He crosses over to Gethsemane and he prays. Verse, Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Same promise as John 14, Luke 24, and Acts 1 verse 4. The same promise of the Father. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. You're going to go into all the world and you're going to preach the gospel to every creature, those who believe and are baptized shall be saved, Jesus said. I want you to go into all the world. This is the mission that they had, and the mission remains the same for us today. But sometimes, church, sometimes we, we have to wait. Sometimes we have to wait. So they waited. Verse 12, they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, that is, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. And they were all with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and the Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. And at that time, Peter stood up, and we know 150 or so were present there on that occasion. So they're there, and they're waiting. They're quarantined. Jesus said, your mission is to go to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria into the ends of the world. But for now, for now, you have to wait. So the question that we have to ask Sometimes it's, what do we do when we're waiting? What do we do when we're quarantined? What do we do when we can't do what we believe we're called to do as children of God in the ways that sometimes we might want to do that? 
Well, turn the page to Acts chapter 2. I want to suggest here's what we do. Here's what we do in the meantime. We be all that we can be. One of the problems with many Christians is we settle for being, for not being what we should be. And we become complacent and sometimes we, we get depressed and, and, and we think we can't do what we're supposed to do. <laughs> I've already had several speaking appointments canceled for the next several weeks going into the month of March. A couple of trips I was going to try to go to Cuba for a few days and they canceled that trip and, and we were going to, uh, had a deal over in Wichita Falls the uh, week after next and they've canceled that and, and we don't know for certain yet what we're going to do about the last of the leaders convention and, and, and some of this stuff, I have to be honest with you, I hate it. That's what I want to be doing, that's what we do. So what do we do when we can't do? But we believe it is our mission to do. We be all that we can be. Well, how do we go about that? Just very quickly, I won't spend a lot of time, but just two or three thoughts here. Look at Acts 2, verse 42. This is after, after the church was established. You know what happened. Peter preached the sermon. 3,000 souls were baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Um, the message got out to everyone and now the church is active and the church is growing and verse 42 says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles teaching number one always always regardless of where you are and regardless of what you are doing always submit to the will of God to the word of God Look, maybe we won't get to worship as much as we want to worship together as a, as a church family in a corporate body Maybe we won't get to have our Bible studies uh, like we enjoy doing from time to time. But nobody, nobody, no, no virus, no government, no church leaders, nobody, no government leaders, no schools, no jobs, nobody can keep you from growing in your knowledge of the Word of God. Did you know that? You, can, you can't be stopped. Nobody can stop you from studying the Word of God. Spending time reading and growing and learning and submitting your life to the Word of God. And one of, the, one of the marks of the church should be that we always submit to the Word of God. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Your Bible might say to the apostles' doctrine. So we must do the same. Then there's the fellowship. Not only do they continually devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, verse 42 says, and to fellowship. Koinonia means communion, means association. You know, we've got to have this social distance kind of thing for a while, and, and we've got to figure out how we're going to deal with that. But, but look, uh, uh, we, we need one another. We still, we still need to stay in touch with each other. We need to help each other. We need to, we need to, to look after each other. Notice what the rest of these verses say. Um, verse 44, uh, all those things that they believed were together, all who had believed were together, and they had all things in common. Um, they took care of each other. If anyone, look at the end of verse 45, as anyone might have need. So let's get practical for a minute. So what can you do during this time of, of uh, isolation, social uh, separation? Um, you know, we have people in this church, some people who are hurting. There are people that they'd love to get together and worship, but they can't get out. I believe it's incumbent upon every one of us. This is not just for the elders. This is not just for the preachers. This is for all of us. We're a family. I wonder how many of us over the last few days and have called our family members who are out of town and who are in other places just to check on them, if nothing else, just to hear their voice. Somebody in this church needs to hear your voice today. Somebody out there, those of you who are watching online, there are people that need to, to know that you're okay and they need to know that you care about them and you love them. So here's one thing we can do. We can, we can check on one another. Koinonia. We can show our concern for each other. I was at a restaurant yesterday. I went and got some breakfast and did a little writing and studying. And the waitress got to know some of the people that work there. And 
The waitress came up to me and she said, I've been thinking about what I, I can do and maybe you can help me. You're a preacher, right? And I said, yeah, well, some people think. And she said, maybe you, can, maybe you can help me. She said, if you know anybody in your church, if you know anybody who can't get to the grocery store and who can't have the things they need, if you'll let me know, some of our workers want to, to do that. And I thought, you know what that sounds like? It sounds a lot like church, doesn't it? It sounds like communion. It sounds like koinonia. So don't think that, well, the elders have got this, the preachers have got this, the care group leaders have got this. You do your part. They had all things in common, and they provided, they shared, and had all things for anyone that might need them. And then the last thing. Here's the last thing we can do. We can rely upon God. I'm not saying here that, I'm certainly not saying we don't need to rely upon each other because I believe God uses people to accomplish his will. I'm not saying we don't need to listen to what others say, media or government or organization. I'm not saying that we don't pay attention to any of that. But I am saying, I am saying that more than anything else, we need to rely upon God. You know what? All of this is going to be okay, right? Everything's going to be okay. You know why? It's not because of a certain individual who sits in the White House or who sits in the halls of government or who rules in the affairs of men. It's because there is a God who is on his throne. And everything is going to be okay. And he's going to protect you. He's going to take care of you. And if you get sick and you die, you'll go live with him forever. And that'll be okay too, won't it? <laughs> I mean, I'm ready. So we rely upon him. So go back and look at verse 43. After it says they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. Look at this verse 43. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Your Bible might say fear, but it's not fear like we think of fear. They weren't running scared. They weren't afraid. They had a sense of awe. You know why they had a sense of awe? Because they knew that God was involved. In that day, it was a miraculous involvement because many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. It won't be a miraculous involvement today like it was then, but you can rest assured that God cares and that he's involved and that he's reigning in heaven and that he rules. And so that led them to do what they did in verse 46. And then verse 47 says, praising God and having favor with all the people. You want to know how you can reach people that need to be reached with the gospel during a time like this? Don't lose control of your senses. Don't blame people. Don't get mad at people. Don't, don't curse the government or the media or, or, or other people. Regardless of what is going on, rise above the level of behavior of many people trust God and praise Him. You know what happened when they did that? The Lord saw to it that there were people who were added to the church every single day. You see, God can help us and He can help us use crises that occur not only in our lives individually but in our lives corporately for the world to see what people who trust God and who love Jesus are going to act like in their lives, how they're going to respond, how they're going to treat one another, how they're not going to live their lives in fear, but they're going to show concern for others. So continue to grow in your love and in your knowledge of the Word of God. Look after one another and continually trust Him and rely upon Him. Would you pray with me? Father, we're thankful today that we're a part of your family. 
We're thankful that we're part of the body of Christ. And Father, we're grateful that, that we have one another. We're thankful for each person who is present today in person and for all those who are, who are worshiping with us online. We pray, Father, that we all will understand today that there are times in our lives when we wait. There are times in our lives when we may be quarantined. But help us never to forget our mission. Help us never to forget to focus on your word. Help us never to forget to care about one another in fellowship. And Father, help us to, to always, to always, Father, help us to always trust you above everyone else and everything else, knowing that you care for us and that we can cast all our cares upon you. Father, we want to ask that you'll bless our young people as they travel home today and keep them safe. And I want to pray that you'll bless our children and help us to hug our children and grandchildren a little bit closer. Father, we, we ask that you will be with the, our number who are hurting today. A lot of our folks are ill at home. They want to be here. Pray that you'll help them to feel better. Bless those who are hurting. Father, especially want to pray for Jeff Green and his family today as he grieves the loss of his mother. Father, help us to love each other. But most of all, help us to love you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you're not a Christian, you want to be a child of God through faith and repentance, confession, and baptism, today you can give your life to Jesus. If you need prayers of this church family, if you don't want to come forward, our elders will be in the back. When you leave, ask one of them. Let them know what prayer needs you have. You can write it on a card. You can send it in to us, email, text, whatever you need to do. We want to be a praying people who care about each other and who pray for each other. If you have any needs, I'm going to ask you to come while we stand together, while we sing this song.